Welcome everybody to the next Greenplum YouTube video. My name is Ivan Novik. I'm a product manager at Greenplum. I'm Ed Espino. I'm an engineering director with Greenplum. And my name is Jacques Eistock, and I work with our customers out in the field for Greenplum. For today's video, what we want to do is give you a demonstration of the difference between Greenplum and Postgres from a performance point of view in a very typical data warehousing scenario. So as, as you may be aware, Greenplum and Postgres have similar code base, but Greenplum is massively parallel. And that's why when you want to do data warehousing and analytics, Greenplum can be much faster and can scale to much bigger data sets. So we want to actually do a demonstration and show you what that means. So Ivan, when, when you keep saying Greenplum, you effectively mean parallel Postgres, don't you? Like there's multiple Postgres is running. So it's like taking one Postgres and making it into many. That's right. Um, well, really taking many Postgres and making it into one, right? In a sense. So we're taking, you know, let's say we want to take a hundred Postgres running on 10 machines or 10 VMs, make it into one unified database. I've often been told or described a scenario like that uh, where they use the term sharding. Is this sharding? This is, I would not call this sharding. In sharding, I would explain sharding as query routing. So when you when a query comes in, you'll determine which Postgres database is the relevant Postgres database for that data. And then you'll send the query there and answer it there. So for example, if you run a big social media site and you want to get the profile information for Jacques, and it's in a Postgres, when the query comes in, you'll send it to the relevant Postgres that has Jacques data. But in this case, we're not routing. We're taking a single query and breaking it up into small pieces and running it across all the Postgreses in order to get the single query to finish faster. Ah, so that would be closer to what had been known um, for a long time as uh, massively parallel but shared nothing. And so Massive. something like a commercial Teradata, for example, or even something like what um, uh, Hadoop tried to do, but more from less from a database side and more from a file system and, and development coding side. Right. The, the trick to Greenplum is to, to, to split the database into many Postgres databases, but then to have the intelligence to take a single query when it comes in and break up that query into a query plan, which will be executed by all the Postgres in the system to bring back a unified answer to the single query. So it's really, um, it's, it's one, it's the difference between sharding and, and MPP is whether um, the query plan can be broken into small pieces by the database and be executed in parallel rather than be executed in full in one location, which you find. And and I have to ask, um, I mean, it sounds cool and um, sounds a little complicated as well. How does that change the way I interact with the database? So Greenplum will expose a host and a port. You'll connect to that host and port through a GUI or through a command line or through an application. And when you connect to that port, you'll be sending SQL. Behind the scenes, Greenplum will be doing all the database work and providing you the results in very efficient manner. But as a user, all you see is a single port that you connect to and send your queries. And then it's transparently works as, as a complete database system behind the behind the underneath the, the hood. Yeah, actually, or or okay. a developer for that perspective too, because you just talk into one database, right? You don't have to do anything special here. Gotcha. So I, so I recently heard a refreshed um, layman's version of how to explain this. So I think it's worth like saying out here. So let's say that we have a physical bucket, not, a, not an S3 bucket, but a physical bucket full of marbles. And uh, somebody wants us to count all of the marbles in that physical bucket. So in a, in a single system, a monolith database, like Postgres, for example, that's essentially me giving Ed this bucket of marbles, and Ed is going to go 
pick them one by one by one and count the entire bucket up. And that will likely, although Ed is pretty fast, that will likely take Ed a, a fair bit of time to do. Chance However, it was Ed you know, to lose his marbles. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and here, and here. Uh, however, if we distributed the marbles among the three of us, we'd literally be able to do it in, you know, a much faster period three of time. Three times faster. Three times faster, exactly, because each of us has a third of the marbles. Assuming that you split out the marbles relatively equally, even if it's not exactly the same amount, they will finish in the same order of magnitude of time. So it may not be exactly three times faster, but it would still be generally close to three times faster. And and really, when you run green plum massively parallel, you're not talking about three um, three parallel tracks. The normal green plum installation will have something like a hundred tracks of Postgres, or five hundred tracks, or a thousand tracks. If you have a thousand Postgres, if you're talking about generally finishing a report. A thousand times faster in green plum than it would finish in a postgres all right so i love it let's see it in action let's so um perhaps ed uh you could tell us a little bit of all of the setup like the infrastructure what you did to create the environments what we're actually looking at <laughs> and that kind of stuff so that everyone at home knows. sure 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 so uh I'm not one to kind of recreate things, right? I'll just try to use the smartest things available that I have at my disposal. Fortunately, we have uh, some green plum offerings that are really easy to deploy in the major IaaS is AWS, Azure, and Google, right? And so I'm able to leverage the deployment mechanism, which is you can purchase this or use the marketplace offering, offering of green plum um, to spin up a deployment for you. And so I've spun up uh, two different clusters, one for where we're going to be running uh, Greenplum. It's an eight node, eight VM cluster um, with the R5, what is it? R5B 8X uh, instance types. And I did the same thing for the Postgres instance, except I'm just going to be using one system there, right? And so just a matter of a couple clicks here and there um, um, from the web UI or from the command line, I'm kind of nerd like that, I'll just do it from, from the command line to spin up these clusters so it's actually fairly easy. Um, on the green plum side, the deployments happen automatically since it's kind of all canned there for our customers to kind of try out and, and use, put in production workloads if they want to. Um, it's fairly much uh, supported product, so it's kind of cool. Um, for the Postgres side, I had to install from the latest RPMs, uh, 14.4, which is easy to do, right? It's, it's, it's fairly easy. Um, when we talk about the data loading side, it's a little bit of a different experience um, from a time perspective uh, for both of those sessions. Do you want to talk about what the data set was and um, how much data and the loading process? Sure, sure. So uh, Ivan loves to throw out those challenges. Hey, Ed, can you try this out? Yeah, it's a real easy. Sure, it was. Right, so uh, um, so what we were trying to do is to get the TPCH data set, it's an analytic data set, it's readily available. Um, and so uh, uh, how much data, Ivan? Well, we need to throw something reasonable. So how about 500 gig? And then Jacques goes, nah, you're crazy. We need something a little bit bigger. So we went up to one terabyte worth of data, right? Um, that gets generated. And these, this is the TPCH tooling framework that kind of does all this, there's eight tables and we loaded a terabyte worth of data. So we're talking about billions worth of rows, not millions, but billions. So the order of magnitude is actually fairly big um, for this uh, use case scenario. On the green plum side, it took uh, 20 minutes to load that data spread across the, the nodes. There's a total of, again, eight VMs, six, uh, uh, six uh, green plum instances segments per, per system plus their mirrors, so there's a total of 96 total segments that are there. Again, took 20 minutes to load. And then uh, I had the joy of trying to figure out how to get the data into Postgres. Not an easy feat. Um, it took me literally five hours to load the data. Going through that process, I had to, I was just, it has to be faster. How can you do this? So unfortunately, I had started, had to remove stuff because it's not a trivial thing to get the data into Postgres. So I removed indexes, I removed uh, foreign key constraints, right? 
I've turned off some other, made some other optimization. You can do some parallelization stuff on the Postgres side, that's fine. But it still took five hours to load this data, right? And I did this multiple times to see if I was doing it wrong, right? But, uh, um, and so that was just to get the data in. Then I had to restore the databases to the original state indexes and, and, uh, and the uh, constraints. And that took yet another hour's worth just to re redo that, that work. We have a good environment now. So with the terabyte of data and green plum, terabyte on Postgres, same hardware to do some demonstrations. Yes, so sir. Jacques, you ready to do some demonstrations? I am. Um, do you want me to show uh, the audience kind of this graphically? Right. And then we can do it why again bring and up, we can show what's going on. Yeah, why don't, we, why don't you bring up your graphical user interface and show a little bit about what data we have, what the tables look like, and a couple of queries. Sure, yeah. So here, it is worth saying, uh, here at VMware Greenplum, you know, we're partners with a lot of uh, tools and, and whatnot. Today, I'm gonna use um, one of the tools that we uh, give our customers uh, that we've partnered with dBeaver on. I'm gonna show uh, dBeaver. So as I pull that up, uh, now you should be seeing my screen. Um, I've actually already connected uh, to these databases. Uh, and again, just to you know, kind of for posterity, this first one is uh, the cluster that uh, Ed was talking about. And this is our green plum cluster. You can see within the green plum cluster, I've got a couple of databases. I am going to kind of click into this dev database here and take a look at what schemas are out there. Uh, as Ed said, uh, there is a TPCH schema out there. And you can see within that schema, there are a number of tables uh, that exist in that schema. Below, you and one thing, is, Doc, um, for the people who aren't familiar with TPCH, this is a data warehousing business simulation, right? So data warehousing and analytics, it's for reporting on your business. Um, and so in this, you know, benchmark, you've got the table about the customer, um, table about customers, table about the orders, table about suppliers, and then for every order, every order gets broken into line items. So an order could have, you know, five or 10 um, individual things that were bought. So this kind of allows you to have a business of a uh, report of all the different sales that are normalized and that you can run analytical queries on this business data. Correct. And to, to be even kind of more specific or, or realistic, right? Imagine if you go to the grocery store, you are a customer via your loyalty card or your credit card number. They know who you are. You buy a bunch of items, uh, which uh, at the holistic level, right? I go in, I get a receipt that is in order. On that receipt, I have many items that I have purchased from you know, rice to bread to chicken, and all of those would be in the line item. If you start to kind of think of that at the business level, I, as a business, have many customers. I, as a retail business, sell lots of orders to my customers. I, as a business, have lots of line items on each of those receipts for each of those customers. So these tables can get quite large in order to do the proper analysis of what's actually going on in my business. Right. So if you were, if you were a retail chain, um, which I don't think this example is, but if you're a retail chain, then not only you'd have it for one store, but you could have it for thousands of stores. And this could be literally not billions, but could be theoretically trillions of individual rows. And, and I don't want to go on a tangent here, but I will for a moment. Um, if you think about what that means and why I would even do this, if I had a thousand stores and let's say a hundred of those stores were not selling as many items as the other 900, I might want to go into my data and actually start to understand what is different between those various stores. Are they selling different items? Are they not selling enough customers? Like what is actually going on? The easiest way to do that would be through analysis of the actual data, looking for either discrepancies or for areas where you think you could improve for those hundred stores. That's right. And I think that's where the terminology biz business intelligence was coined. This is how you create business intelligence is by going through the actual historical data and 
generating insightful reports on top of it. Totally. And so now to get back to brass tacks, um, you'll see down below here, I've connected to a Postgres database, which Ed had spoken about earlier. Inside of this Postgres database, um, here's my database appropriately named Postgres, and I have a number of schemas. You'll see within here, I have a TPCH schema, just like I do up at the, on the green palm side. And so what I've done here is I've gone ahead and pre-populated just a couple of simple queries to make sure we're all on the same page. Now let's go ahead and check out, uh, make sure that we're on the right uh, Postgres database. And you can see here, we're running Postgres 14.4. Um, everything looks hunky-dory. So kind of the first thing that I'd like to do is the big, you know, like, hey, of our big table here, and you can kind of look um, look around uh, to our, our previous discussion, right? What constitutes a big table? table? Well, of course, the line item table, where it's got everything that you may have bought at the grocery store or wherever, that's gonna have the most number of records. So let's just get an idea of how many records we're actually talking about. So right now I'm asking Postgres to count every record within right. the line item table. So, and Jock, just as one more explanation, select count star, although it seems obvious, I'll just explain it, right? Which means, basically count the number of rows in the given table. And then the way that's gonna get, once the SQL will come in and that will translate essentially into a scan operation. So it'll have to scan the rows from the disk. And then as it's scanning, it'll have essentially internally a counter be counting. And then once it's done, it will feed it back up and return the, the counter. I mean, that's the okay. trivial. It make, makes point. sense. and and. It, you know, it, because it's got to do all that work, that's a lot of work. So I expect it to take a, a little bit of time. I, I will say that, you know, as a an analyst or a DBA or even a business executive, if I'm looking at a report or, you know, kind of trying to do my job, you know, once you start getting past that 30 seconds, you know, I suddenly lose my ready to go out for of, going out for lunch kind of an idea. While the report and the thing is that I was told is by some analysts is the the interactive capability of Greenplum or the iterative nature, you know, the idea that you can kind of run a query, get back the result, and then think of the next query. This is kind of a, um, a buzzkill to that process when you know you don't know the result of the first query, you can't generate the next idea, do the next experiment until this one finishes. So really, the faster you can run the queries the more productive your analysts can be to kind of come up with the next idea and the next idea and the next idea because they're getting results. Absolutely. So so now I'm at the spot at, at two full minutes, I'm at the spot where I almost kind of think there could be a problem. And so I'm going to pick up the HR or the help desk um, phone to Ivan and say, hey, Ivan, can you log into that machine and just make sure everything's working? Sure, let me do that for you. Um, so I will share my screen. Can you see my screen? Yep. Yes, I can. Okay, so this is, um, I've connected actually through um, PowerShell, just, um, and then run essentially top on the server. And actually not top, I've installed thanks to Ed, uh, HTOP. Uh, HTOP shows you the different cores independently. So, um, you know, just quick, uh, you can see this is not a trivial system, right? These systems have 64 um, or 32 processors. Um, and I will try and go through a little bit of a debugging process, but what I'll see here is that essentially the query is is running here and I can see it's running on internally on CPU number nine. So CPU number nine is doing about 40% CPU usage and probably also blocking a little bit to get the IO from the disk while it processes. Otherwise that core might run a bit faster or hotter. But the interesting thing is it's single threaded, right? So there's, even though we have a cluster of VMs or even though we have 32 cores, 
this operation can essentially be run in one CPU core, and it's waiting for that to finish. Well, so the positive here would be, right, I could have uh, 31 other queries or colleagues running this same query. And uh, for the record, we are now at 245 seconds that it's been running. So all 31, 32 of us would be waiting equally as long. You could. Um, and then, however, as I mean, and that gets you to back to where our discussion of sharding versus parallel processing, right, which is you can route queries to different systems and have them run on replicas and whatnot. But if you really want to just get a single query done faster, ultimately you need to be able to go and break that query up into pieces, right? You can't just send it to another place, right? Because no matter where you send it, that individual query is not going to get any faster unless you can decompose it into parts and run it in parallel. It's kind of what we, we talk about on the modernization side of just applications too. You take that monolith and you break it down into microservices that can function independently, but still service a, a greater need. Right. The so, query so this query. Yeah. Did that query finish? It, it did. You got to bring your screen share. Not, um, not finish, unfortunately. It is still running. And so, I, you know, I, I guess this could be a, a great time to um, just see uh if this query could run any faster on our green plug cluster before we do that um before we do that ed was going to mention what was that going to mention yeah i was going to mention the the database oh. sizes right you you guys talk about the application and this that and the other thing but i was concerned about just the, the practicality of getting these systems up and running and i wanted to show you point out some things we have a terabyte worth of data here and on the Greenplum side, you see the dev database, it's 513 gig in size. So there's a certain amount of, comp obviously, compression that's going on here, right, as, as Greenplum stores that data across the, the various segments. And let's take a look on the Postgres side, what their sizes look like. Um, they're significantly bigger, right? Um, one terabyte of data just in the line item itself, right? So there's no compression happening here. Um, that I can tell in this to vanilla install, right? And that's um, correct, right? The as of Postgres 14, although we are we are in discussions and Postgres teams in discussion, but as of Postgres 14, it does not do compression, right? It's a non-compressed database, and that's one of the sweet spots of Greenplum too. Is just making that data smaller by um, not only doing compression but also I don't think you've done this Ed, in this use case, but you could also switch it to be a column store. I think correct. To do, this one is not using column store, right? That's correct. Okay, so that would be another optimization too, is to look into the use of column store, but we have multiple storage options where with Postgres, there's one, which is fine. It's the, the traditional store, but of course, if you have lots of data, you're not gonna get the compression. Yeah, and I'll, and I'll just you know kind of uh, succinctly say, what does compression do? Well, right now, Postgres is ha asking the disk to give me every record off disk so it can count it. When we go to Greenplum, because we have less data on disk because we've compressed it, the simple physical act of asking the disk for that data automatically becomes faster. Right, and if you do, and so, if you are using, in this case, Elastic Block Store, from Amazon, Ed, right? Yeah, and, maybe yes. And so, I mean, Elastic Block Store is not um, slow, but it's not as fast as, let's say, a local NVMe. So if you can cut down the traffic, that could have a good impact. So now I'm gonna go ahead and run that same select count star that's been running on the Postgres side over on the green pump side. So I'm gonna submit that query um, on the Postgres side, uh, just to come back to it. It's actually still running here uh, we're nearing 500 and, and almost 600 seconds that it's been running. Oh, oh, on the green pump side, we're already done. How much? So how many records we're do we have? getting? We have let's see, three, three, three. Wow! So that's that's not just uh, millions. That is almost six billion records. Six billion took, line items. Six billion line items, which six, are parts of a transaction, parts of an order of a some store. How long did it take to yes. run? It took 23.6 seconds in order to run. So 23.6 seconds 
uh, to run on Greenplum. Ivan, um, is there a way that we can go back to the Greenplum cluster and you can kind of show the audience what's different between what we were seeing in Postgres earlier to what we just saw in Greenplum? Like, like why did it go so much faster? Okay, let me share my screen on the Greenplum environment and then we can have a look. So right now, nothing is running, right? And uh, I'm right. connected to one of the Greenplum environment here. So why don't you go ahead and run the select again? Okay, are you ready? Here it comes. Yep, let's run it. So here you can see that it's occupying multiple cores, in this case, six cores. But bear in mind, this is a multi VM system. So really there's about 50 of these things running across the entire environment, um, all processing in parallel, which in theory means that it should be 50 times faster than Postgres, although it could be a bit more because of the compression, which will reduce the IO, but it's rich. So I think um, that's- And, and I, I can confirm that the query that we just submitted uh, took 18.39 seconds. And you can confirm based on the CPUs going from 100%, well, several of them going from 100% down to zero, that Greenplum was done doing all of its work. Correct. Correct. So let me let part. me inject one thing again, guys. Just so you know, these systems for the Greenplum, it comes in a in a primary uh, primaries and and the uh, mirrors configuration by default. So we have data integrity in place as well. As you see, we had, there's a bunch of Postgres processes which are running there. Those are half of them for the primaries and half of the mirrors, it just comes out of the box. On the Postgres side, uh, honestly, I had to turn some stuff off to optimize it, but there's no HA support there at all. No HA. replication going on. Right, so if a single host fails, then Greenplum will keep running. Of course it will, yeah, heck yeah. Right. And, yeah. and for what it's worth, just to say it out loud, transactionally, right? So if a transaction has not been committed um, in its entirety, then it will not be um, present or visible to anybody until it's fully committed, fully asset. So um, Jacques, can we do another query, which is a little more interesting from a business point of view, just to show, just to give a little example? Yeah, um, let me share my screen again. And we had already teed up, and as you can see, I'm back to the Postgres side. We'd already teed up a query that basically says in, and again, kind of layman's terms, I want to go to the same table that we just counted, that 6 billion row table. And I want to look for a very specific date. So December 14th, 1996, I would like to count in this line item table, how many records per ship mode we actually I think ship mode means like um, like when you do send the shipment, did it go through air or sea or freight, those kind of options. So let's go ahead and run this. Uh, this now means not only do I have to figure out how many records are there, but I, I have to group by the column, right? So I'm, I'm doing a very complex query uh, all here in this um, singular easy SQL line item. Do you have any bets on how long this might take, Ed? Yeah, I think this is close um, to an hour, an hour. And I can do the, okay. I mean, I, I could, without wasting everybody's time watching, but um, again, it's running on a single uh, thread. So it's, um, it's ah. yeah, I'm just looking on the top, but it's, it's not, uh, I mean, it's one process there doing the work. Yeah, and, and I've gone through the process too. I wanted to make sure that the data that was coming back was the same, you know, the results were the same, right? For for this query, for other queries actually that did computations and summations, aggregations, right? Right. So the data it just took a long time. We don't have time. Well, and, and, like and, this, but. You know, the from a query completeness point of view when it comes to Greenplum, because because there are um thousands of insulate production installations of Greenplum that you know, some of which run uh, tens of millions of SQLs per day, right? And and really the challenge of a database technology is to be able to support any infinite SQL that anyone could develop. So mm -hmm. I think having the confidence that Greenplum has been run across billions of queries per, per month across sites all over the world 
of any infinite complexity and type and giving back the, the correct result every time. So that, that's an important um, reliability factor you need when you pick a, a SQL solution that it be mature and have the, the confidence that it's that it's fully baked. Well, and I think the, you know, to just add on there, the compatibility with Postgres makes it even easier for um, folks to get started because most organizations have Postgres expertise and compatible products already. And since Greenplum is literally just parallel Postgres, it looks like one big, much faster Postgres database. Right. And so, you know, just to piggyback that on, right? This query, the count star query, we know took 10 minutes. Uh, we believe that this query will take at least 10 it minutes. It should take longer. longer on the postcard. It should take longer because not only does it need to read all the same data as the count, but it needs to then filter and um, filter and group by the, the shipping mode and then aggregate all that. Absolutely. And I think Ed uh, kind of already cut to the chase there and said, like, it'll take about an hour. So it will we come don't want to watch this for an it hour. It will come back. Right. So stress is rock solid, so it will definitely come back. It just may take longer because of no, nothing else except for pure physics. Right? And, and John, records have to get counted. Correct. And before you run this, one more kind of key point, which is I know we're kind of showing a use case where Greenplum is so much faster than Postgres. And the important thing here to understand for everyone watching is that selecting the right use case for your database is key to all this right if you're going to be storing billions of rows and running reports and analytics that's where you want a parallel solution like greenplum if if this um application was essentially doing um one row at a time sequels and trying to do you know 100,000 or a million updates per second then postgres will will do great on that use case right but it's just once you try and you love Postgres so much and you try and stretch it to its its breaking point of big data and of reporting and analytics is where you can still get everything you love about Postgres, but just have it work faster. Sure. And I actually think that the combination in organizations of Postgres and parallel Postgres allows for use cases across the entire spectrum, OLTP or transactional spectrum, versus DSS or decision support or analytical spectrum. And because it's the same Postgres, that means you're effectively giving your users, your environment, your business, the ability to have an open source based, uh, almost Oracle Exadata uh, competitor, because you have the ability to do both within the same effective product. Correct. And um, while we just before you run this one more thing, uh, which is I think the the open source is really a key point, because in the long run, when a technology can be open source, it allows worldwide community to learn the technology, to embrace the technology and to kind of keep a, a limitation on the potential cost of the solutions. Right. They don't explode the way single vendor proprietary solutions. So really. I encourage all the CIOs out there and all the decision makers to consider the long run that open source technology really is to the benefit of an enterprise to strategically opposed to single vendor proprietary solutions. Yeah, and I, I could have Absolutely. done this exact same demo um, building from source and putting this together, no problem. Um, I'm using the, our, uh, again, our offerings, which are available on the cloud today. But anyone can actually do this today. Sure. All right, let's run this query. All right, so without further ado, um, the this query the on the Postgres report. side is currently at 370 seconds and still running. I'm going to go ahead and submit this same query over to the Greenplum side. And it is back in 89 milliseconds, so less than a second, with um each of the ship modes and the appropriate count of line items for each of those ship modes that is a real world and, and you know what huge Josh, difference. one thing i just realized is you know let's say i'm the analyst and i just realized that 1996 was the wrong year this is not what i was looking for i needed 1997 so could you run 1997 the same day sure um 
let's see what happens when I change the date of this particular query. Right. And it is back in 409 milliseconds. So that's the idea about iteration and data scientists experimentation, right? That you can get a hundred wrong analyses done quickly because you see the output, right? You can learn from your what the data tells you and then move to the next iteration of the analysis, right? When you're sitting there running one query per day, you just can't be efficient as a data scientist or an analyst if you can be when the results come back right away. Yeah, it, it might not be that it's wrong data, wrong results, right? But you're just narrowing it's in not, on the no, I, didn't, I wasn't implying wrong result yeah. of the query. I was implying that my idea as an analyst of what I wanted to query was wrong. Exactly. And I don't see that until I actually see the numbers and I say, oh, I didn't mean to ask you for 1996. I meant me to ask you for 1997. But I don't realize that until I saw the output, right? And so we hear from data scientists a lot that the the biggest advantage of Green Plum is that iterative data exploration speed that you can come up with a hypothesis about your data, validate that hypothesis and move on to the next one in rapid fire and you're not waiting on multi-hour reports. I agree and, and that's a great way to close this video. So I appreciate everybody uh, tuning in and watching. Uh, come back to the YouTube channel for Green Plum in the future where you'll see more of these types of videos. Uh, and we're always looking for feedback. So and, uh, yeah, please leave us a comment time. as to what you want to see next in the demo. Absolutely. So thanks again. All right. Thanks, guys. Bye.